take a new turn. The objective was to give Gambia a new start, to ensure that by force of example of leadership, the hopes of the pe people will be rekindled for a fairer and better Gambia. And by creating the institutions and instruments to ensure that fairness and that better Gambia, despite the poverty and the pain of injustice and ignorance, the people will steer the nation forward towards a brighter future, not only for this generation, but for a generation yet unborn. I must say that the Barrow administration has done its best. Our position is that its best is not enough to eradicate the poverty, the ignorance, and the injustice that had been inherited from the past and will continue to exist irrespective of goodwill. Economically, we have a GDP of about 108 billion. It is anticipated that it will rise to 115 billion in 2022. But if you calculate that in economic terms, this is pittance and cannot really sustain the demand of our population for better lives. The services that are being rendered are inadequate. And you have a revenue base of about $25 billion for 2021. It is anticipated to rise to $29 billion. But if we examine the revenue base, it comprises domestic revenue and grants. So combining the grants and the revenue is what gives rise to the 25 billion. So the actual revenue base, excluding the grants, is about 13 billion. And the grants 12 billion. So they are almost equivalent showing a real dependent economy. And the grant base, you have project grant of about 8.8 .8 billion and budget support of 3 billion. So if you see development taking place, you will see that part of it is from your tax money and part of it is from grants. And if you look at the tax base of the economy, almost 13 billion is coming from a taxation and only 1.5 billion from non-tax revenue. So essentially there is no sovereign national wealth that can facilitate the development of the country. The country is entirely dependent on taxation and grants. So this grant tax and debt-based economy is not sustainable and cannot eradicate the poverty of our people. And this is why Doi is calling for system change, the transformation of that base, because Gambia is a rich country. We have abundant natural resources, arable land of 550,000 hectares. They're only cultivating about 327,000. We can produce all the rice we, we, we need to consume and it is measured about 200,000 tons. We're producing only about 57,000 tons. We have a national development plan, but you do not see anything being said how that national development plan, short term, medium term, long term, could lead us to food self-sufficiency. There is no investment program that could lead us to that food self-sufficiency. No investment program for import substitution so that we'll be able to generate what we need to consume. And therefore, not only provide what we need, reduce what we are spending on importation, but also provide the basis for employment in the country. This is why Dwight has made it very uh, clear 
to the population that this country and its young people have no future under the First Republic, Second Republic, and the current dispensation because no effort is being made to ensure the expansion of the productive base of the economy in order to sustain the human beings that are now demanding for better lives. Over 500,000 children are coming out of our school system every 12 years. What do we have for them on the, an economy which simply is actually measured Well, uh, I'm sure the whole world is listening to us, but I'm getting hands from there. That is confusing the whole situation. I don't know what is happening. I think it was a, 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 that there was an issue with the microphone, but it's, it's resolved, so it's all right to proceed. Well, let it be known that the fault is not on my side, but technical fault. <clears throat> so essentially, what Doi is promising the Gambian people is to move away from a service-based economy that depends entirely on taxation and introduce services supported by the productive base of our economy. Look at our ocean. It can generate all the wealth that we need. And that wealth from our minerals, from our ocean, from investment in the productive base, from our public enterprises, would actually be deposited at the central bank and will have a cooperative bank as well as an investment financial facility to be able to sustain the expansion of our earning capacity and the capacity to eradicate poverty. An investment capacity, a financial facility, will enable us to support, for example, our Navy. Currently, the Navy is designed to ensure security in our territorial waters. But that could only be done with financial backing. And the country currently depends more and more on assistance rather than being able to sustain such a Navy. We are saying that that Navy will have a security component, but will also have a productive component, where there will be trawlers designed to fish, land fish on our territories and ensure that we generate employment and expand our export of fish and therefore increase our earning capacity of foreign exchange, which will enhance deposits in our central bank into that financial facility that will continue to generate more and more investment. Some people say that DOI is against the private sector. We are saying we are not against any productive base that we inherit. Rather, the private sector in the Gambia is weak. Its contribution to the tax base is very minimal. And therefore, what it needs is to be properly guided because we have up to 1.6 billion being exchanged in the banking system without any sign that it is coming from or going back into the productive base of the economy. So in that regard, the promise is that a joint administration will strengthen the private sector that is productive and that is genuinely in the national interest and would in fact form a partnership with some of them, not only for the Gambian economy, but for an economic of scale to be able to ensure that we export into the sub-region and we have services in the sub-region which has roots in the Gambia. So we will examine all the potential of all private sector producers and look at the economy they are serving currently and if they can expand into the West African market expand into the African market and further afield through collaboration with other African companies, we will ensure 
that that is facilitated. So the private sector has better capacity to grow under a joint administration than any other administration that has ever existed because there is no sovereign national wealth, no investment capital in our central bank that will be able to facilitate such partnership and also give support for an economic of scale in the sub-region and elsewhere. We are capable of eradicating poverty by creating a sector in the bank for cooperative banking, which is interest-free loans, because you have investment facility to be able to make profit, and that profit is siphoned so that it supports interest-free loans to be able to eradicate poverty. We are able to ensure that the 550,000 hectares that our people currently cannot cultivate to ensure food self-sufficiency will actually be given primary focus so that we produce what we eat, not only what we eat, but also what we export to be able to earn the foreign exchange necessary to be able to cushion our development. It is important for us to show very clear why DOI is different and why it's talking system change. 56 years, we have seen all Gambians that going to a village, and we have gone to those villages very recently, it is like they are in the Stone Age. We fought for independence to control our land. We fought for independence to eradicate the poverty of our people. We fought for independence so that the people would take charge of their destiny. But today, the poverty remains. The alienation remains. And the suffering remains. We have to explain why. Parties will say the prices of rice should go down. The parcel of oil should go down. How? If you are still importing the rice, importing the oil, and you have to incur the cost of importation, how can you reduce the prices? What control do you have over those prices? It's either you create the scarcity of goods or high prices. This is the trajectory Gambia is locked in. We can only change those prices by producing the rice, which we can, and we'll show you how produce the oil which we can, produce the tomatoes which we can, produce everything we are consuming, the butter, the yogurt, the eggs, everything we are consuming, we can produce because we are blessed with the environment and natural resources to be able to do so. People have no capacity to produce now because they do not have the financial wherewithal. So companies will come from abroad go to the people in the villages, sign contract with them, and rely on them to be able to produce banana on their soil with their labor in order to export it, in order to make wealth at their expense. Is that why we became independent? And that is the policy of many political parties since independence. The commercialization of agriculture is not designed to empower our people to produce more so that they can sell more and earn more. It means handing over our land to others who have the financial wherewithal to invest. Because the people cannot go to banks to take loans because of the high interest. We are saying that is not pre-designed. It is created by policy. Policies that are poor. So our problem is the poverty of policies. And that is what we intend to eradicate. That is why we are saying we are going to have a cooperative bank that will give fertilizer seed and farming implement to farmers without interest. They will go and expand their production to a commercial level, large-scale farming, large-scale family farming, and sell their produce. And there too, we will have a cooperative marketing system that is not designed to exploit that farmer by looking at the market differentials we will ensure that the farmers are protected from that exploitation so that the world market price will actually serve their income generation rather than serve the interests of parties. That is what we intend to do. So in that regard, we are convinced 
that through the cooperative bank, we can help the farmers to have what they need to be able to produce the, all the inputs, but at the same time, by protecting them from any form of exploitation, they'll be able to earn more. So we expect then the farming community to be enriched by that policy. And by so doing, the environment will change in two ways. There will be community development and there will be household development because if their earning capacity increase, their household will earn more and therefore their housing system will also change. We'll have rural housing system just like you have Social Security and Housing Finance Corporation, which was designed to establish low-cost housing for workers who contribute to that fund. We are going to make sure that the farmers also will contribute to a fund so that they can have low-cost housing in, in the rural areas. We will expand the community-based development plans. How are we going to expand it? There is simply no effort to create any structure, financial structure, to be able to finance village development. You have village development committees everywhere. But a village development committee without a financial base can never bring about any form of development. So we are saying that each village must have a financial structure. There must be a village treasury. And our position is that these 56 years of getting people's rates and licenses paid for certain facilities like shops, which goes to the area council, has been a, 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 a wrong policy. The policy will rob the villages and will not give them any form of development. No water, no electricity, no roads, no health center, no, no facility that you could call general welfare. And the purpose of a government is not only to be entrusted with authority, but to use that authority to promote the general welfare of the people. So we are saying that we will institute a new system of local administration or regional administration. First and foremost, all those funds that are coming from the villages will be deposited in the village treasury for village development. Where will the regional treasury get resources or district treasury? Well, that's what sovereign national wealth is all about. Today, every person in this country by head contributes to the national budget because of indirect taxation. Every importer will pay duty, excise at the customs. But in selling the product, what is paid will have to be added to the price of the product to recover what has been deposited at the level of customs. So indirectly, everything that you buy, you are actually contributing to the national coffers. At the moment, that tax base is ensured by our collective contribution. But how do you share that? So that there is mutual benefit. We must apply the law of proportional development, balance and proportional development. And it means then, that you distribute that wealth to the regions proportionately and those regions will now complement development in the villages distributing it to the district in a proportional way so that they will complement development in the villages with that balanced development if a particular village wants to provide water fencing to women gardeners it will be able to have a project and then cost the project and determine whether the village treasury will be able to finance the project. If that cannot be done, then it means that the district treasury should come to the aid of the village treasury. The regional treasury will come to the aid of the, of the, of the village treasury. And it's the same thing with the national treasury will always come to the aid of the village treasury in terms of equalization grants to ensure that there is balance and proportionate development of society. We have answers, but you have had political parties controlling national government and local government for 56 years. But where is really the solution to rural poverty? The architecture we have as our manifesto 
is finally what is going to bring about the system change that will eradicate the poverty of our people where there will be community development and household development complementing each other to ensure that the people live better lives. Esteemed media practitioners, we are simply introducing how we intend to change a system which for 56 years kept our people in abject poverty. It's not predestined. We are capable of eradicating it and we will eradicate it with the support of the people. But as we can see, there are many political forces seeking the mandate of the people. In that regard, it is important to examine the nature of these forces in order to prepare the ground for convergences or divergences in our political architecture. What is very clear is that there was a split in the UDP creating what we now have as NPP and UDP. We do have the APRC, but here too, we can see a split in the party. What it will emerge to be, we don't know, but they have been drivers of the political process. We have the GDC, there had been splits. Well, it is a driver of the political process. And we also have what you call PDRS as part of the drivers of the political process. So these parties had in 2016 emerged to be drivers of the political process and were expected that in this 2021 presidential election would have been contesting for the particular seat. But undoubtedly, many parties have come on board. How they're going to align themselves, we will still guess. But what is important is that we have a political landscape where many forces are at work and many efforts are being made to see how to converge their efforts in order to build coalition. The lesson, coalition 2016 cannot be replicated. Coalition 2016 came as a result of the situation that we had in 2016. There was just one dominant political force. All the other political forces were marginalized and the citizens really had no hope of change. And therefore we had to build hope by showing that we can build the mass base that could effect the change that the people wanted. So it started by bringing together presidential candidates so that through unanimity, they will select one among their number to be the presidential candidate who all will support so that we can address the problem of incumbency. That is how it started. When convergence came in terms of selecting a flag bearer, but differences in terms of who should be selected, then we went to the second phase of involving all the political parties in equal number to actually select one, whoever is selected, all will agree to support the person regardless so that we can effect the change that was necessary. That is how 2016 came to be the year of transformation of a different time, transformation through the ballot box. On that day that the election results were declared, the Gambian people must have come to the realization that power really truly belongs to them. And that's why we insisted during the impasse for that power to be maintained, that electoral legitimacy to be maintained, that constitutional legitimacy to be maintained. And it was maintained. A new Gambian should have been born, a Gambian fully conscious that their power and voice will determine their manner of government. And together, they are responsible for the destiny of this country. Whatever happened, they cannot abdicate from responsibility. Now, we are faced with a new situation. That change had come through the ballot box. But many people are saying 
the change has not brought them what they had designed for themselves. That is why we talk about regime change is a change of government. But what people are now demanding is a change of a system so ensure that their poverty, any injustice, their ignorance would actually be eradicated. Those forces who recognize this could come together to be able to salvage the country. But bringing people together just for a change of a regime at this moment will be an abuse of our population who are demanding, the population who is demanding for that change to really come about a change that is meaningful, a change that is purposeful. So in that regard, Joy's position is that we will not be part of any coalition just for the sake of changing a face. We can only be part of a coalition whose fundamental aim is to eradicate the poverty, the injustice, and the ignorance of our people. That's number one. Number two, that coalition building could come in two ways. Fundamentally, it could come through unanimity by those who intend to stand but have the same objectives to really select among their number the person who should actually lead in that regard. The issue of elect, electing a flag bearer is something that Doi is still wary of by virtue of the experience of 2016. Because we do not want anymore to be held responsible for failure. We must therefore negotiate with maturity so that we prepare for success rather than failure. We must ensure that what happened in 2016 does not happen again. That is our fundamental object. So therefore, we are ready to negotiate with all partners with one condition that we will not allow any possibility of 2016 being repeated again. The Gambian people own the Gambia. Their voices and their power will determine the future of our country. The information they receive and the conviction they have will determine the type of politics we are going to have and the quality of our polity. Power belongs to the people. And power consists to no one without a demand. That is what our leaders have always taught us. So therefore, if the people are to concede to entrust their power to anyone, it is their duty to demand what is necessary for them to live in liberty, dignity, and prosperity. They should not demand anything less. They must demand for the eradication of poverty. They must demand the eradication of injustice. They must demand the eradication of ignorance. If they demand any less, then they are subjecting themselves to be spectators of history rather than the architects of their own destiny. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I hand over to the chair. Could you take all this thing to the church? If you want to receive monies from UK, Europe, USA, Canada, Switzerland and the rest of the world, Supersonics Money Transfer has got you covered. With the largest payout network in the Gambia, you can now receive your monies anywhere you are from Kartong to Koina with less hassle. Yes! You can receive monies from your family and friends in UK, Europe, USA, Canada, Switzerland and the rest of the world with our safe, secure, fast and convenient service that offers you the largest selection of payout locations in the Gambia. Supersonics Money Transfer. We are currently in third. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is the uh, conclusion of the statement by the presidential candidate. So now the floor is open for questions.
Okay. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The, uh, uh, that's the uh, conclusion of the statement by our presidential candidate, Halim Salah. The uh, floor is now open for questions. And I would like to uh, uh, have each one of you, just to tell each one of you that if you are called upon to, uh, to ask a question, please uh, state your name and also identify the media house that you represent. So we will uh, start with the first question, please. Thank you very much. One thing that was very resounding everywhere we went was that uh, I did not need to try to convince anyone. I believe those people who were part of our caravan would affirm that. They said, that during the impasse, there was not a single Gambian who was not listening to you. And by virtue of that fact, we are convinced of your sincerity. That became very clear, and I think those of you who followed all the meetings we had, there was not a single meeting where the actual statement was not made by one person or the other. So in that regard, one must say that already I have the advantage of being visible to the whole nation before the caravan tour. Secondly, we explained very clearly the reason for the poverty of the villages. Why they don't have electricity, why they don't have water supply. And there's not a single elder who denied the fact that their villages have never had a village treasury. And the simple explanation that we gave was that a household cannot survive without money for the day. So every household must have an income to be able to sustain the household. But how can a village exist without money to sustain the village? So we must say that by explaining that all villages should have village treasuries became a profound statement that all villages accept. So I must say then that the people do accept system change. We've also told them the reason for their poverty, that why is there a differential between the price of groundnuts in Senegal, the price given by Chinese companies, and the price given by uh, companies in the Gambia. And obviously, uh, they could see the difference. And the explanation is that the world market price is the same. Why the difference then? Of course, they are being shortchanged one way or the other by those who are buying their nuts. And we're saying we are out to protect you from this. Thirdly, We've also explained to them, for example, we were in Sanja. The women produce a lot of tomatoes. They cannot sell it. They have no market for it. We explained very clearly that you should have a country where what you produce is actually processed by the country. Because we are importing tomato paste and producing all these tomatoes. And we can clearly produce a tomato paste. Why don't we invest 
in, in, in the industry that can produce that tomato paste. And that means that the women will be saved from what is actually happening to them, uh, the rottening of, of, of their uh, tomatoes. So in short, we are convinced uh, that uh, the, the, the Gambian people are convinced that system change is in their interest, especially when we talk about the cooperative bank. We are convinced that the message is clear to people. It is how far uh, the message uh, has gone so far uh, and uh, uh, how long we will have time to be able to ensure that every single Gambian clearly understands the message. We are convinced at this time that we are being hard and we are happy that we are welcomed by the population who believe that we have the sincerity to solve their problems. Uh, secondly, there was a second question. Which, uh, well, what we can see from uh, the interaction with the population, when you get down to shake their hands, uh, they almost wish to, I will not say break it, that will be a negative statement. But uh, if you are not studied, I don't think uh, you'll be able to survive the real pressure that comes from the people. And it's the pressure of love, which uh, has no pain. In fact, it has the joy of the heart. And we, that, that is an indication that people are showing readiness for change. Okay, the next question. Please. Uh, coalition coalition 2011 I Dingue <laughs> Uh, kitok ak ñi nga xamné nit yi doyla ñi fa nek 
mën nañu continuer liggéey bokku ci national assemblée même su féké né ma nekku té fék que légué lék ñu sayanté ndax nit so démé ba xam ay yeb té yow ñu ngi bokk ak yow légué lék ci gannaaw mën nga léna satt li nga xamné dess nañu ko xam mu melni tollu nañ fofu fo xamné jaratul may ut place ci national assemblée ndax liggéey ba nga fo rendre def yakar na né def na ko ba paré ci liggéey président itam li léna wax ni lér na lañ né ñak ngi ndol gi nek ci rew mi notel gi nek ci rew mi mën nañ ko fe génné amul ben doomi gambie fi mu nek ku dégg wax ju ñuy wax nga né wax ji day néen la mënu ta né kèn mënu ta dagg ak ñu xara ba ci présidentiel debate du am ben ko xamné ki taxaw da présidentiel boté ko xamné ki ñun dina jakarlok mom ñun ñu wax liñ nara defar rew mi mu téggi ko mu lo mën na len ko dégg suñ ko mëné téggi rek bo man man suma ko na resigné nekatu ma candidat bon ñun am nañ lu wër lo xamné li amul kenn ku ci am ñaari xel né li moy li rew mi soxla wa suñ ko waxé nit ñi ba paré ak nit ñi né fi mu nekk ni dé ñun paré wuñu ak té man itam tollu na fo xamné euh wax dé soko sété def na lima mun yépp ah li war rek ma nopalu dal di dimbalé ñi nga xamné ñoy nit ci doy ndax ñu mëna am ci suñu biir ño xamné ñi liggéey bobu dinañ ko mëna continuer man ma nek el de listet man nga xamne legge lek mun na le la jaral lo xamna len de suma deme ba nga xamne taxawatu ah di ngeen am lamegn bu tal ci soufi gambia waxatu man e ni ngeen am nit ko xamne ngirem na ki nek president de gambia ci 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 jamono joju ndax te duma tok diko setan muy def lu ko neex ah mu melni bobu mom dik na len ko ne ni ngeen am baat bo xamne ci soufi gambia dara du rerati te lu nek dinañ ko sañu wax ah lol mom digna len ko waye nak ma nge wore ne bi moy suma mujjentali tax bu pour pour euh place president euh lol la ñoy wax sax ñi nga xamne ñoy samp coalition ne man lima joxe pour walu coalition moy li ñoy oyé ci anglais one term presidency taxaw rek benn yoon de duma taxawat ah ku def coalition ak ñun na nga am garantie ne am nga one term president suma jexale duma uté té président so incumbency am ñaaral bi itam an inclusive government moy government bo xamné dina xëcc ñëpp ñu mëna tabax gambie bu bëss loolu ju paré nañ pour def man paré na pour def lo ñettel bi itam pour génné incumbency nga nga tok ci nguur di jëfo alalé rewma di jëfo doole rewma pour mëna paré yaas pour togat wala ku ku la jégué mu tok bobu dé man waré na né dina fexé loolu du am né suma togone mbem niti doy ki utati president na nga xamne awma farfar lok yow te xamna ne lolu xewal na ci mali ci alpha konare niti patem yam mere ko lol ndax mom daf ne du farfar lok ken lolu nak lolu lañ wara continuer su so ne pare tu lo pour nek wan ben wan tam president nga nek da nga pare itam ne soko neke ba pare te fek ñi lay isi ay coalition la bon do amati ben façon yi farfar lo da nga emale ñep ñu ut rew ko ko jox tek bax a lol de dik na ko rew Well thank you very much I think that is the key issue You cannot have a people with power to determine their destiny and you keep them poor and helpless hopeless That is why we talk about the economic structure that we are going to put in place The economic structure is meant for a country that has gone through this colonial experience where we do not have industries at the time and therefore we do not have a strong economic base to be able to have what you call consumption based welfare what has happened in many countries in europe by virtue of the fact that they benefited from the colonial experience and they could build industries 
and generate employment for their population. Uh, therefore, those who are unemployed, the state will accumulate a lot of tax resources to be able to at least provide some fund for those who are unemployed. So even if you are unemployed, you'll be able to have unemployment benefits. But in this country, there is no possibility of unemployment benefits. So all these hundreds of thousands of young people are depending entirely on the extended family. And that is why many people definitely must be seen to be callous to say that, well, uh, they're just uh, drinking attire, they are aimless and just insult them uh, day in and day out. Uh, if you understand what they are going through, the congestion in their homes, uh, what really poverty is all about, the insult they are even receiving from their parents, and that is why many of them at the end of the day will prefer to go and die in the Mediterranean Sea than, than to stay at home because the insults become unbearable. And you come to a point where you, do, you don't even see. You hear people call bany lao, that is, uh, people don't sleep at night. They have nowhere to sleep. You go to a home, you are above 15, 16, and you find out the parents are just living in one living room. So some do not even have a bedroom. Some a bedroom and a living room. For how many children? Eight children, nine children. So you see that most of those children will have to sleep outside. And in that regard, they become very vulnerable to the pressures of influence in doing anything that could be disruptive to your life. So we are not dealing with an ordinary situation. And I think people underestimate the type of poverty that exists in the country. I was a social welfare officer. I knew these young people. I, I worked with them. I went to their homes. I saw their conditions. You know, they explained themselves to me. So I've lived their, 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 their suffering. So I know that's what pushed me into politics. I could not bear that suffering anymore. I knew about it. I wanted to effect change. But when I started working there, it became so real that I had to work for change. Otherwise, I'll be the biggest hypocrite on earth. So in that regard, I am emphasizing to you that our economic policy is to build sovereign national wealth. And we have made it very clear. Our ocean can yield the type of resources that we can put in the central bank to be able to have a cooperative bank. And the cooperative bank, it is already happening with the women, what you call OSUS. You put your part, the other put part, you put it together, and you give somebody some capital which has no interest to be able to invest. That's what cooperative is all about. We are saying that the state is a cooperative. We own the Gambia. We own the ocean. We own the land. It's a cooperative. That's why we talk about the cooperative state. It's a cooperative. So since we own it, we each must be empowered by that state so that we can be productive. For the farming community, we are saying we give you seed fertilizer farming implement interest free. For somebody from GTTI and you want a milling machine, you want to mill the coos into flour, the cooperative bank will give you a milling machine so that you can work and you just simply pay interest free. Somebody who wants to sell that coos or who wants to have a bakery, uh, whatever you do in the chain itself, you'll also get the resources to be able to buy and sell and pay back without interest. So that is the aspect that is aimed to eradicate poverty. Not only that, we are also going to build a productive state that will continue to build industries that will continue to process our goods in order to generate employment. It started with GPM. GPM came to a point where it could even produce soap. So it means that it could produce oil, it could produce soap. And therefore, expanding that production will increase capacity to a point that we do not have to import the oil that we are consuming. That will generate employment. We don't have to import the soap. That will generate employment. And with what you have, you can reinvest into all the sectors, tomato paste, etc. That's how industries expand. But if what you generate in income is actually siphoned, it means that you could not have an investment base. We are saying at the central bank, we'll be depositing all these accounts of public enterprises, and that will serve as investment capital to expand the productive base of the economy and generate more and more employment. We can produce all the butter, all the cheese, all the yogurt, everything that you see here that you go in a shop to buy, 
that is a productive place for our people to, to produce. So yes, we can generate as much employment as possible. Not only that, uh, because we do not have consumption-based welfare in the country, we intend to introduce it in another way, through a national service, to ensure that at a given level, once you finish the 12th grade, we introduce a national service where you look for skills in any quarter or knowledge, and for one year, the state will be responsible for your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and what you need to keep yourself clean and healthy, so that at least you start to build up a base of national unity, eradicate crime of all sorts, and inject a sense of love of country and people in those young people, and they will be able to be the people who will produce uh, the type of architecture we need for another Gambia. Not only that, we are saying the army will be changed in nature. I've started saying that, that the army will be a productive force because it's a mighty force. You, you cannot just create it as a war machine. We have no war to fight. So what we need to do is to transform that army into a workforce with skilled personnel who will be able to build our wharfs so that we can have river transport. We'll be able to build roads. We'll get all the machinery. They'll build the roads. They will build the public buildings, etc. So they will develop all sorts of skills. And, and therefore, when they leave the army, they can go anywhere to utilize their skills in civil domain. So in short, we have an architecture that will get every Gambian working in one way or the other. Well, okay, thank you very much. Uh, in terms of our perspective of coalition building, we have said it. And of course, this is a period of consultation. I'm sure uh, we are involved in part of those consultations. So uh, there is no doubt that consultation of one sort or the other is taking place. Because if you are a presidential candidate, uh, you may wish another presidential candidate to support you, and you may go and consult that person. So consultation does not necessarily mean that uh, you coalesce. So it is a process, and I believe that the processes of uh, consultation is on. What the ultimate consequences will be uh, will be evident to, to, to all uh, members of society, as every consultation that will lead to coalition building must also be accompanied by some form of a memorandum of understanding that will be signed in public and known to the public. So I'm not aware of any memorandum yet signed in that regard, but uh, I'm sure consultation is taking place. Number two, uh, you've emphasized the cooperative bank. Well, even before you transform society, we've told you that uh, you are having a revenue base of 13 uh, billion uh, with a with grant of uh, about 12 billion with a 25 billion uh, budget prospect. So uh, you, you are aware, I'm sure, that uh, this year the government tried to create a project to really support household and over 800 million was spent on rice, schools, uh, on rice, uh, oil, and, 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 and sugar. Well, imagine 800 million. You mean that cannot be put at the central bank and say that, well, we will utilize that money at least to give seed fertilizer and farming implement to a certain number of people so that they will produce without interest because you are giving them the 800 million as a gift. You mean you cannot give them that 800 million to produce without interest? I think you can see the rationale. So therefore, if you can go and give AIDS, which is gift, but this is saying direct that to production. Let it be in the form of farming implement. I believe that is very practical. And we are not only talking about this small, tiny economy. We are saying investing in our mining, investing in, 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 in our ocean in order to generate more income, to ensure that that income that is generated will go into the central bank 
in two ways. One part is meant for cooperative banking to eradicate poverty, interest-free loan. But the other part is an investment to make profit internally and externally. So therefore, the profit that you earn from the investment finance of the bank will be utilized to cushion whatever losses may arise out of defaults in the cooperative banking system. Well, I hope that you can understand very clearly that the cooperative banking system is definitely the only way that we can rely on to eradicate the poverty of our people and get our people to be productive and working. If anybody has another system, well, we are open to debate. And, and you can challenge all these political figures to come and debate how they intend to eradicate the poverty of our people. So the third aspect is, well, something happened in URR and people should not see it as UDP doing. When it was happening, we were there. Most of us did not know even what was happening. This is an individual case with a group of people belonging to a party. And of course, when a person wears a party attire of any sort, when something, when something happens, they will talk about the party, they will associate the party with. But this is an isolated incident. It does not reflect a conflict between UDP and PDYS. And that incident is a matter that in actual fact could be handled by the Interparty Committee. I am the co-chair of the Interparty Committee. Of course, I've been away for a long time by virtue of an illness. And then immediately I have to concentrate on my presidential candidature. Otherwise, my party will decide uh, something about me. So therefore, I had to conceive and work as quickly as possible to merit uh, the decision they have made to select me as a presidential candidate. So in that regard, uh, I've not functioned as a co-chair. Uh, Mr. Nyasa has been functioning very well, but the Interparty Committee is operational. And I would believe that if there is any individual problem between a party supporter or even a party member with any other uh, group that uh, they will resort to the Interparty Committee to solve it as quickly as possible. And that's what I envisage. Uh, but it's a matter that happened in Woolley, if that's the incident you are talking about, and the actual MP for that area was left entirely to handle the matter, and he has not come back to me to say he is incapable of handling the matter. But if the incident you are talking about is meeting the UDP and then fraternizing or sororizing with them to be more gender sensitive, you know, uh, clearly we, 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 we have that as the architecture for peace in the country, that all Gambian people own the Gambia. And we are all trying to get mandate from their authority. So therefore, we cannot alienate those people who, in that regard, our duty is really to unify those people and allow each to choose as they wish. That is the democratic ethos. We are committed to it. We have said it in our manifesto. We will not in any way punish people for not supporting us. We will serve those who support us. We will serve those who oppose us because they are the Gambian people who own the wealth of this land and deserve and uh, the, 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 the service of everybody. So that is our position, that the people deserve service and we'll give it to them. Okay. Um. Next question, please. Okay. Uh, I have four questions. But I Can you please state your name and which media has you recognized? Okay, I am from Guyana Online. Okay. So I have four. I'm going to ask. And what's your name, please? Usman Zenika. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So, but Honorable, uh, we just want to know PDYS's position on the TRC rotation that has been postponed and postponed indefinitely. So we want to know whether the PDIS government will come to power to prioritize uh, that recommendation. And then the second one is, uh, we, have, we have had some news that Jahadunre would be the like, standard bearer of PDIS. Could you please clarify it? And then, if you want, I can ask you all. Yeah, okay. you, you can ask any question. Okay, the third question is on, the, on, on corruption. Because the, the current government has failed in implementing the Jahadunre Commission. 
the recommendations. We want to know as well whether the PDOS government will implement those uh, general commission recommendations. And then the last and the final one is we also want to know, you know, we at Kainabo, we are very concerned about uh, manifestos. We want to know the update on your manifesto. Uh, uh, we in the media houses got access to the manifesto when you come to the government people. Thank you very much. We'll start with the last one. The intention, the we wanted the presidential candidate to defend the manifesto before people like you, uh, after you have access to, to, to it, and also before university students. But uh, as I have rightly said, uh, because of illness, it could not have been done when it was supposed to be done. So it is being said we had to go to the caravan tour and give that a priority to become visible in the political space. What is essential now is to ensure that uh, we do precisely that. So before nomination, we will have in one hotel or the other, a program where the presidential candidate will come with a published version of the manifesto where all will be able to have access to it uh, and then engage in being, let's call it in the, in the hot seat to defend what they intend to do in uh, 2021. If it actually is given the mandate of the people. So that is how transparent we will be. And I'm sure we'll invite you to represent Gainako, or maybe they will send somebody else, I don't know. But uh, we will we'll make it public. So number two, you've asked the question, uh, yeah, TRRC. Well, don't you think it's a contradiction to say that the recommendations are still at bay and that uh, we give our view on, on recommendations that do not exist at the moment. Uh, I don't think uh, that is a fair question because it's a hypothetical question. Uh, although I can say very clearly that the objective of setting up the truth, uh, reconciliation you know, and uh, re reparation commission was to emulate what happened in South Africa. And clearly uh, what was happening in the Gambia uh, should have been guided by the experience of that country. What have they achieved? If I were to be uh, the head of a government, I can assure you that the first thing I would have done is to look at those people who are actually the victims and ensure that they come into contact with those victims who are in South Africa so that they can exchange notes about what actually happened to them and how they manage to heal. And if they move through that, then you must hear, it's not only hearing from the TRRC, I would have wanted to hear from the, from the victims, how they can ensure uh, that reparation and reconciliation. Uh, it's more the voices of the victims I will listen to than the voices of anybody else. So apart from the facts that are guarded, the fundamental objective is healing. And healing is personal, is psychological, is the individual. So uh, I would take a totally different approach after the facts are guarded. Of course, that is the approach that is taken. But thereafter, what happens next? Uh, clearly, uh, I would have taken that, that particular responsibility. And whatever recommendation come from those victims is what is what implemented. Number three, you raise another issue. Bill. Yeah, anti-corruption bill. You see, people have said it. The National Assembly has wasted time. Uh, they have, in fact, been accomplices of, uh, of, of, of corruption by not hastily passing the anti-corruption bill. You see, people don't know how the National Assembly functions. The National Assembly has powers. And powers to pass bill is one of them. But the executive has powers, the powers to speed up bills or to leave the bills in the hands of the National Assembly to scrutinize. The first process, if the executive wants a bill to be hastened, they introduce the bill under a certificate of urgency. Within 24 hours, the bill is passed. 
and it becomes a matter that goes to the executive for signature. I think you've already seen that process in the National Assembly. But when a bill comes and it is not under a certificate of urgency, it is passed onto a committee and the committee start to scrutinize that bill you know, clause by clause. And in scrutinizing it, they invite experts to come and give their opinion on this. And sometimes it's a whole volume of expert, experts being taken. And it can take, go to other jurisdictions. It can take as long as it, you may think in order to do the scrutiny. Because at the end of the day, the will, bill will be entirely different from what the government has introduced. And I believe that aspect also has been seen in some of the bills that came to the National Assembly where all the clauses, almost all the clauses, has some form of, of uh, uh, editing. So in short, uh, the question is, is, is understood. Uh, but if the executive wants the bill to be, to be enacted by the National Assembly, or to be passed by the National Assembly within 24 hours or rejected, then what all they need to do is to withdraw the bill and introduce it under a certificate of urgency, and you will have the bill in Asia. So it's like the foreign government have uh, No, no, no. I'm not drawing any conclusion. I'm just telling you processes. Okay. <clears throat> that the process, they may not know, they may know. I don't know the, the, the knowledge base that they have. But now you have the knowledge base, not only a knowledge base, but this has been implemented. We have advised quite a number of ministers that if they want anything to be speeded up, all they need to do is to uh, introduce it under a certificate of audience. Uh, obviously, we'll get the national. We'll, uh, if, if you elect me to be a president and I have a cabinet, uh, obviously, I, I've already told you, we already have the knowledge base. We'll just simply withdraw that bill if it fails to pass before then and uh, introduce another certificate of urgency. We will we'll review it. Well, the general commission, again, this is a commission. A commission of inquiry is not a court. And what is given are recommendations. So you have to review those recommendations to see whether if it is challenged in a court of law, it will stand the test of time. So we have said very clearly that we will ex establish an expert bank. I recommended that to... Uh, in the incoming president then, incoming president then. And all of you have had it before the December uh, Christmas uh, celebration. I recommended that we should have an agency for sustainable socioeconomic development, and it will comprise at least seven people with the capacity in all areas of, 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 of government. And then their duty will be to establish a database of experts on all core areas of development. And therefore, before the actual assumption of office, they would have looked at what is existing, what could be developed in the short term, medium, and long term. But of course, that never materialized. So obviously, if I were a president, that is the first task that will be done. You will create experts to look at all this uh, that had uh, been inherited and see the merit of everything that has been said and take decisions that are in the interest of the, of the nation. What is always important is to know that we are moving towards the future and we must learn from the past to save the future rather than live in the past. Thank you. I just wanted to add to this. Okay, are you... Uh, so, yes, my last question was... Uh, what is the last question? The general commission. Yes. Uh, what is the general commission doing? Because the general commission is now a different entity. Yes. Can you well, is it fair to be using a person's name about any issue without going and interview that person and know what is really in his or her mind. I, I, yes, that's what I'm saying. Uh, you can hear, in, you know, I think you are a profound thinker and a seasoned media practitioner. Uh, information by itself is yet to be news. It's information that you actually confirm to be true that becomes the news. But information that is not confirmed is rumor. So you are asking me to confirm a rumor when I'm having a press conference saying that I'm the presidential candidate of Britain. 
is the presidential candidate also, who is holding a press conference here. Is that not enough enough fact? So the presidential candidate of Dwayne is addressing you. Or do you doubt that? No, it's okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I don't know whether my will sideline me again. Oh, did I sideline you? I think you asked the question. Yes. Did you ask the question? I yes, okay. yes you, you've asked the question. So give someone else a chance, please. And I'm looking at this line up here, and I think, let's see, Yamika really has a good representation here. And I think some of the people from Yamika really has asked question, or was it one person who asked the question? It was one person, I believe. And then Kelfatu, I don't believe that we have anyone from Kelfatu. No, no, you have. Yes, 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 no, yes. Oh, okay, you have one from Kelfatu. Okay, so um, what about who's to pay by Joe? Oh, yeah. I'm here. No, she so, wants to ask. She asked. Okay. So, that was what I She's written here from Gambia Town. Yes, yes. I'm here. Oh, okay. So did you do, do you have a question? No. Okay, so so I don't know why they wrote your name down here. Part one of signers. Okay. Can, can I just take the next question, please? Someone who has not asked the question yet. No, no more questions? Yeah. Okay, then we'll proceed. Okay, uh, <laughs> I just need to clarify On my way here, I received a text message from my friend informing me that, you know, on the way Halifa Sunday is announcing, you know, this presentation as a national assassin in Germany. So I just need clarification whether this is true or not, because I just received the message. Well, I have you been following the news? No, I don't know. But no, 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 no. Don't answer me even. Maybe I should not ask you a question. Uh, you, you have to be firm and, and and defend your profession. Say that I ask you a question. Answer it. Okay, I will answer your question. Uh, Honorable Usman Silla is here. I was ill for a while, uh, uh, infected with coronavirus of the worst type. Uh, which I will narrate later to show how I escaped from my uh, contract of death with coronavirus. I refused to sign the contract and became alive. Uh, essentially, uh, I went to the National Assembly for the first time, and the surprise was that they made me the Speaker of the National Assembly for the day because of the Speaker and the uh, Deputy Speaker were absent. Did you, didn't you watch that? Yes, I watched that. Well, no, why, why, saying, why are you asking about resignation? No, this one is saying that you, uh, you will be announcing your resignation as National Assembly member today to run for presidency. That's what that's the message. Is, is it, so that's ha, why ha, I need to clarify. How would you, you see people running for presidency as and still remain as National Assembly member? Well, you should do your research. Ask the question later. Go back and see whether there is any law forbidding people from holding position in National Assembly and running for the president. And also find out whether it has happened before or not. Then in the next press conference, you can tell me the facts and ask me. I'm not asking, I'm just asking for clarification. Well, clarification means that I am still a National Assembly member. I'm still a National Assembly member. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions, please? Does anyone have questions? Okay. Well, um, did you want to give closing remarks? Or would you just well, I don't closing? think uh, closing remarks would be necessary. Okay. Except right. to say that we will have the same questions uh, to clarify the Gambian population in our local languages so that uh, everything said here would actually be said in the languages that the people do understand. Linga hamne, viral nengko, kisun bir wahdi agmidi, moine nyari nek, moine kichireumi, bo hamne kiy wate, chila buna dik, nek bo hamne kaso dolla, kaso notella, kaso rirla. Agnek bo hamne, negi tedala, negi fonkiala, agnegi lea. Ne, sen carta wate, chabila agunt. Sulene hemi tek sen bo pati kasonol, kasore, a kasonotel, 
Voilà, nous avons vu que 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 nous Tilimbali <laughs> We thank you very much, media practitioners, for tolerating uh, this uh, long presentation. We'll try as much as possible uh, to actually produce it in writing before the end of the day, hopefully, uh, we should get it to you as quickly as we could. But generally, I do not write uh, before the presentation. I write after I've done the presentation, so that we'll take that and try to produce it as close to verbatim as possible. Thank you very much. All right, we'd like to thank you all very much. If you want to receive monies from UK, Europe, USA, Canada, Switzerland and the rest of the world, Supersonics Money Transfer has got you covered. With the largest payout network in the Gambia, you can now receive your monies anywhere you are from Kartong to Koina with less hassle. Yes! You can receive monies from your family and friends in UK, Europe, USA, Canada, Switzerland and the rest of the world with our safe, secure, fast and convenient service that offers you the largest selection of payout locations in the Gambia. Supersonics Money Transfer. We are currently... Yeah.